Hello and welcome to Cleveland Classic Cinema. Tonight's film is 1958's Monster on the Campus, directed by Jack Arnold. I say that if you were injected with this, you'd revert to a primitive anthropoid, physically as well as mentally. One scientist dared investigate the incredible phenomena. Our pet dog reverted to an antediluvian wolf. Look at those teeth. That dog is a throwback. Our simple dragonfly had become a winged monster of a species extinct for millions of years. Now, before your very eyes, see a man revert to a half-human anthropoid from the dawn of creation. A monster leaving behind a trail of death and destruction. Oh, it's impossible. Nobody's got a footprint like that. I'll rest when I find the killer. That's not your responsibility. That belongs to the police. Madam, I know what I'm doing. Even he did not suspect the incredible truth. Neither did the police, nor the girl coming to keep a lover's rendezvous. <laughs> The first time I saw this movie was when it was on Big Chuck and Houlihan a long time ago. I was over at my friend Scotty's place and we were sitting in front of the TV with the usual refreshments. As I recall, uh, popcorn and orange crush. Scotty was then and is to this day a traditionalist. And as we sat down to watch the movie, I remember getting this odd feeling of trepidation concerning the title, but I just ignored it. I'd felt it before and since when sitting down to uh, watch a movie of Scott's choosing. I mean, don't get me wrong, the guy has, for the most part, excellent taste in both good and so bad it's good movies. He was one of the first to appreciate the bizarre charms of Ed Wood movies when I showed them to him back in the late 70s. And let me add that I was collecting Ed Wood movies a good half dozen years before it became fashionable. I think that's proof of... Well, it's proof of something. If I figure out what it is, I'll mention it again in another intro. Anyway, as Stephen King once said, if you're going to be a fan of horror and science fiction movies, you better develop a taste for good baloney. That can be something you develop over the years, but it helps a whole lot if you're born with it, like I was, and like I'm willing to bet 98% of my viewers were. That's the only reason I can think of them for continuing to watch the movies we show. Most of the movies we show fall into the baloney spectrum, some more than others, and when I pick them out, I try to make sure they are, at the very least, entertaining. Of course, every so often you have something that's just horrendous, such as, you know, the Monster Walks or Devil Girl from Mars, but I try to keep those to a minimum. The point is, I'm willing to forgive just about anything in a movie as long as it entertains me. I can forgive bad writing, bad acting, bad direction, bad dialogue, bad sets, bad cinematography, just about anything. One thing I absolutely cannot abide in movies or in real life, for that matter, is stupidity. I'll get to the real life stuff in a minute, but let's deal with this movie first. I swear to God, I don't think I've ever seen another movie with so many stupid characters, and I mean aggressively stupid. People in this movie do things that are just completely contrary to the things a person of normal intelligence would do under the same circumstances. Monster on the Campus concerns Professor Donald Blake, an anthropologist at Dunsfield University, who gets a chance to examine a coelacanth recently caught in the Pacific. Now, the first thing you see in his classroom is a row of cast faces representing the evolution of man. One of them is Piltdown Man, which was exposed as a hoax three years before the movie was made. Uh, I suppose the, re the news hadn't reached Dunsfield University yet. That's all forgotten, however, when the coelacanth is delivered to Professor Blake. Like any good anthropologist dealing with a prehistoric fish that has a mouthful of razor-sharp teeth, he picks it up by taking the tail in one hand and putting his other hand in the mouth. When he sets it down, he's surprised when a jaw clamps shut on his hand, cutting it, 
and then his hand slips into the bloody water the fish was shipped in when he moves the tank. Then, being a professional, what does he do? Does he clean the wound and dress it in sterile bandages? Does he go to the infirmary and get it treated? Hell no! He's a busy professor and doesn't have time for that stuff. He sucks the blood out of the wound by putting it to his mouth. Now what the prof doesn't know, but finds out in due time, is that the coelacanth has been treated with gamma radiation to prevent spoilage. Maybe there wasn't any, you know, butylated hydrotoxitoline available. While this does prevent the creature from spoiling, it has the unfortunate side effect of devolving whatever life form comes in contact with it, as we find out when a dog laps up some of the bloody water and immediately becomes feral. If feral means it grows an oversized set of plastic fangs and starts snapping at everyone that comes within three feet of it. No one figures out how this happened, but the prof notices the fangs, which are a good six or seven inches long, and are sticking way out of the dog's mouth when taking a saliva sample. The next thing isn't a spoiler unless you can't figure out what the title of this movie refers to. Professor Blake himself becomes a throwback. I'd say he becomes a Neanderthal, but I think maybe Neanderthals were a little more polite than what he turns into. The movie was directed by Jack Arnold, which gave me hope during the credits that it would be better than it was. I certainly can't fault the direction. There are several very interesting elements in this movie that are purely directorial touches. So I can't fault Jack Arnold for the quality of the movie. It's all the fault of the script. The writing is just... Careless is the only word I can think of to describe it, and that translates to stupidity in the characters. Not that the acting is on Oscar level either. I'm not going to point out any fing- I'm not going to point any fingers here. You know, I don't want to get a reputation for being nasty after all. I think it'll suffice to say that you'll recognize the bad acting in this movie without my help. What's the police lieutenant though? Sorry, I can't help myself. Director Jack Arnold was born Jack Arnold Wax on October 14, 1916, in New Haven, Connecticut. He began his career as an actor in both on- and off-Broadway productions in the 30s. He served in the Army Signal Corps during World War II, apprenticing under documentary filmmaker Robert Flaherty. After being mustered out of the Army, he began making short films and his documentaries of his own, 1950s with these hands being nominated for an Oscar. He was hired by Universal Studios as a contract director and made his feature film debut with 1953's Girls in the Night, going on to make his first science fiction film the same year as It Came From Outer Space, with a script adapted from a Ray Bradbury story. A big fan of science fiction since his childhood, he went on to make the classics Creature from the Black Lagoon, Revenge of the Creature, Tarantula, The Incredible Shrinking Man, and a personal favorite, High School Confidential. In addition to dozens of TV shows ranging from episodes of Peter Gunn to Gilligan's Island and The Love Boat. He once said, I love science fiction. As a youngster, I used to buy all the pulp magazines. I love them. I was very pleased when I was assigned to direct my first science fiction film because I was still an avid fan. The more I did this type of film, the better I liked it because the studio left me alone. Fortunately, no one at that time at the studio was an expert at directing science fiction films, so... I claimed to be one. I wasn't, of course, but the studio didn't know that, so they never argued with me. Jack Arnold died on March 17, 1992, in Woodland Hills, Los Angeles, California. Arthur Franz was born on January 29, 1920, in Perth Amboy, New Jersey. During World War II, he served as a navigator for the Army Air Force. After getting shot down over Romania, he was captured and imprisoned in a POW camp, from which he escaped. Franz didn't often play leads and was mostly relegated to playing secondary characters in films such as 1953's Invaders from Mars, but in 1952's film noir, The Sniper does a great job of playing a tortured serial killer. Arthur Franz died from emphysema on June 16, 2006 in Oxnard, California. Joanna Moore was born Dorothy Cook on November 10, 1934 in Parrot, Georgia. Her mother and baby sister were killed in a one-car accident, and her father, who was driving, died a year later from complications of the injuries received in the accident. She was a gorgeous woman coming to Hollywood after winning a beauty contest in her home state of Georgia. She was spotted by a Universal producer at a cocktail party 
and won an acting contract, appearing in her first film, 1957's Appointment with a Shadow, after appearing in the Lux Video Theater in 1956. She appeared in dozens of movies, including 1958's Touch of Evil, directed by Orson Welles, but is probably best remembered for playing Peggy McMillan, one of Andy's girlfriends on The Andy Griffith Show. As it turned out, her character on that show was wealthy, and that pretty much ended her relationship with Andy, which I never understood. I mean, here's this gorgeous woman who can cook as well as Aunt B, and she's rich, so Andy breaks it off with her. That was one of the few times in the run of that show, which I love to this day, where I thought Andy acted like a jerk. Incidentally, if you really want to see Andy really act like a jerk, see his performance as Larry Lonesome Rhodes in 1957's A Face in the Crowd. It's terrific. On April 3, 1963, Joanna Moore married Ryan O'Neill, and the marriage produced two children, Tatum and Griffith, both of whom became actors in, later in life. After they divorced in 1967, her life began to go downhill due to alcohol and drug addiction. She disappeared for decades and was discovered working in small theater projects in the Palm Springs area. With her daughter Tatum at her side, Joanna Moore died of lung cancer on November 22, 1997 in Indian Wells, California. Troy Donahue was born Merle Johnson Jr. on January 27, 1936 in New York City. When he was 14, his father died. He was sent to military school and there became friends with fellow student Francis Ford Coppola, which led to his being cast in The Godfather Part II as Connie's fiancé, Merle Johnson. He was studying journalism at Columbia University when he got into acting, appearing in stock productions. After dropping out of Columbia and moving to Los Angeles, he was eating a cheeseburger at a roadside diner where he was discovered by director William Asher, who landed him a screen test at Universal. His first film was 1957's Man Afraid. He spent most of his early career appearing in small movie roles in television series, including Rawhide, Maverick, and Wagon Train. He appeared in 1959's Imitation of Life and finally became a star of sorts when he appeared as Johnny Hunter in the same year's A Summer Place, the role he's probably best remembered for. After his contract was dropped by Universal in 1966, his career went downhill and, became addicted, and he became addicted to alcohol, painkillers, amphetamines, and cocaine. Later in life, he appeared in John Waters' Crybaby with Johnny Depp and a few direct-to-video releases. Troy Donahue died of a heart attack on September 2, 2001 in Santa Monica, California. Monster on the Campus is a pretty forgettable movie. Unfortunately, it's the kind of forgettable movie you never forget seeing. I've certainly never forgotten it, and believe me, I've tried. As I said before, there are a few things, and it's very few, that are pretty impressive, but they're only shots in the movie. Two of them, in fact. And if the only thing I can take from a movie is two shots, something's wrong. It's not really hard to see what's wrong with this movie, but at the very least, the stupidity of the characters makes you feel superior in some way. I remember that at the beginning of the intro I mentioned something about going off and the stupid people in real life, but I just thought, you know, why should I bother? Why talk about stupid to you guys if you just are, you know, if you're about to waste 77 or so minutes watching epically stupid people? The stupid people out there are too damn stupid to know what I'm talking about them anyway. I would say they know who they are, but they don't. Here's a hint, though. If you watch this movie and you identify with the characters, now you know who you are. So right now, sit back, relax, and enjoy Monster on the Campus, right here on Cleveland Classic Cinema.